Um, welcome, everyone, uh, in our uh, new webinar of Silk, from Silk.co about data storytelling for NGOs. Uh, I'm here with uh, Sarah from Silk.co. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Sarah Hi, work, used to work at Human Rights Watch, and now uh, uh, luckily works for us. And, uh, she, <laughs> uh, and she's from Lebanon originally. And uh, our guest uh, of this episode is Jessica from Social Media Exchange. Hello. Hi, Jessica. Um, and uh, we're going to talk to Jessica today about uh, about her work as uh, uh, as a yeah in with her NGO and um, uh, how she presents data to her to her audience and uh, anything that comes up uh, uh, really. Um, for those that you don't know uh, us, Silk.co, we're a data pub publishing platform. Um, we aim to be uh, what YouTube is to videos. We want to be for data sets. Um, people can. Uh, upload a data set to Silk and create an interactive website out of it. And uh, uh, on top of that, they can, can tell a story about the data with visualizations and text and so on. So if you don't know us yet, check out silk.co slash home, and uh, uh, you can see many examples of cool Silk sites. And NGOs also use us uh, uh, from time to time, and, and journalists, which we really like, because we believe that Silk is a very good platform for uh, uh, for like this grassroots uh, personal journalism or for NGOs. Uh, so yeah, Jessica, uh, welcome again. Thank you. Um, yeah, can you tell us a, a little bit about uh, about social media exchange, about your NGO, how you uh, what led up to your founding Smex, and what can I say Smex by the way, or is yeah Smex. Yeah, we, we say SMEX. We, we didn't uh, plan it that way, but that's what people started calling us because social, social media exchange is kind of a mouthful. I'll try. Uh, I'll, I'll probably jump around a little bit. but uh. No, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, so, yeah, so um, my partner in SMEX uh, is Mohammed Najem, and he's Lebanese. He and I are husband and wife team, and we started SMEX in 2008. Um, with the idea of sort of after the 2006 war, we saw a lot of uh, challenges and gaps in the ability of uh, local NGOs and civil society to really leverage the new um, sort of digital media and social media that was really coming coming alive at that point. So we started SMEX as a training organization, and um, we did a lot of workshops on how to use Twitter, Facebook, creating Facebook pages. We produced a lot of guides. Um, we always focused a lot on producing content in Arabic language, and as um, sort of the the scene of digital and social media has changed over the past eight years, um, we noticed that, uh, as a lot of organizations have, that the environment for expression and for using these tools is becoming much more restricted. So, uh, you know, I was just mentioning that, you know, in 2009, the, the so-called green revolution in Iran was one of the sort of catalysts for people to really get on Twitter in the region. 2011, with um, the revolutions in Egypt, Tunisia, and the other <coughs> sort of uprisings um, around the region really uh, drove a lot of adoption of digital and social media and a lot of independent journalism, a lot of citizen journalism. And then since that time, um, despite all the optimism that we all sort of felt at that time, um, we've been seeing sort of a decline uh, in a lot of places and sort of a repression and restriction of um, the ability to exercise free expression, to do reporting. Um, and so with that comes sort of a, a real need to uh, advocate for an enabling environment for the use of these tools. And so we've sort of integrated over the past four years a strong component of advocating for digital rights, uh, which is the freedom of expression online, it could be access to internet, it could be um, uh, uh, the right to privacy or freedom from surveillance, which 2013 and the Snowden revelations were sort of another uh, inflection point for um, digital and social media in the region and, and around the world. So. So SMEX's mission is basically to continue to provide training um, to some degree, and we do that through online courses and making guides and resources accessible. 
but we're really starting to focus a lot more on the research and advocacy around digital rights yeah. and um, the enabling environment itself. Great. So you just um, you just talked a little bit about digital rights, and I was wondering what you thought about um, like why do you think that digital rights are so important today for journalists and activists? Um, because you say on your website that uh, digital rights help them help people move towards an equitable and democratic society. Um, and I was wondering how you see SMEX's role in that, um, mm -hmm. and why do you think that's pr probably very crucial uh, today, especially in the well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, what a lot of people will tell you is that digital media uh, has sort of presented one of the very few avenues for expression and for independent journalism in the region. And okay. so um, as narrow as those paths might be, uh, and, and they might be narrowing, it's really essential to keep them open uh, as much as possible. So that's that's really why. And I think I think that actually goes for sort of globally. I don't think the region is unique in in the restrictions and, and the repression that we're facing. We see it in other regions as well. So I don't I don't want to um, just say it's happening in the Arab world. However, I do think that there are, there's sort of a, a really critical point here where um, because of the conflicts that are going on. Uh, that it that it's it's pretty critical that we give it a lot of attention now. Mm. And um, uh, when you like when you try to educate, as you say, journalists and activists, are those do you are those uh, two separate groups, or do you see them more as one group, or do you try to like uh, like reach out to to specific groups of I don't know professions or roles? Yeah. Or how do people find you also? Yeah. yeah, that's also a good question, yeah. Uh, how do people find us? Um, well, we, we do. So when we're, <laughs> when we're writing proposals and things, and you have to, because um, we're a grant-funded organization for the most part, although we do do some training for um, fees, um, you know, we say journalist, activist, citizen journalist, um, and and you know those are very vague definitions of, of groups. So really, you know, we do sort of try to serve all of those groups. And but I don't know that I have a really clear definition for any of those groups. Um, I you know I'm I'm strongly in the camp that you can do journalism and also be advocating for something. And I'm sorry for the background noise um, if you can hear that, but. Uh, that's okay. So, yeah, it's only fine. Yeah. Okay, if you can't hear it, great. So yeah, so you know that that you can do good journalism and still be advocating for a point of view. I think a lot of investigative journalism is like that. I think a lot of sort of the muckraking tradition is like that. So to me, to us, it doesn't really matter. What we what we really want to do is reach people who are interested in using these tools to sort of scale their efforts, to be able to coordinate and um, organize with each other across distances as a way of channeling around, um, you know, sort of blockages and barriers. And uh, yeah, and so that, that's sort of how we look at things. That answers your question. And how people <laughs> find us? Um, well, I mean, you know, we don't, we do a lot of different things, I guess. So through our training programs, through our social media presence, um, through our presence at different conferences, we're active and Internet governance. We're active in def different regional networks. So I mean, it's been a lot of sort of building that constituency over the past eight years. Cool. And um, and like, can can you maybe give like a concrete example of what do you think is uh, like a uh, like a successful outcome? Like if you if you educate a group of people, like can you um, do you? I, I, I uh, can imagine you stay in touch with them and see what they they've done with that information, for example, or can you, they've worked yeah. on projects. Um, yeah, okay. Projects. Yeah. About I mean, you know, um, we have a long-term view of sort of impact, but yes, we we are still in touch with many of the people that we've trained. Um, some of them work for us. Some of them are leading. Um, protests in Lebanon, like for example with the Youth State Movement, many of the activists that are a part of that are activists that we've worked with, um, either as peers over the years or they've attended trainings of ours. Many of the communications officers and advocacy 
NGOs have been through some of our trainings. Um, and then, you know, in terms of policy, I think, you know, that's a much longer term sort of proposition. But, you know, we've soft legislation, um, you know, working with our peers and, and colleagues, we've soft legislation in, um, in Lebanon in 2010 uh, that was uh, for an e-transactions law that allowed for illegal search and seizure of hard drives and, and you know, those provisions, those kinds of provisions. We've helped our colleagues in Iraq um, uh, push back against uh, badly drafted cybercrime laws. And, you know, um, and we continue to work with a lot of our, our colleagues and sort of network around the region to track what's happening through um, things like the Digital Citizen Newsletter, which I shared um, the link in the showcase area, um, you know, where we're trying to make sure that we keep the cases of activists and journalists who have been detained or arrested or otherwise sort of punished or, or intimidated um, for what they're doing online in the public eye, uh, you know, to, to try and, you know, force some sort of change. Um, and it's from all of that work that, that we started thinking about how do we collect these anecdotes, these stories, which can so often just seem like one-off sort of single stories, you know, one person, one name, one country. How do we take a look at um, these things and, and develop stronger cases for advocacy, stronger cases for policy change, both within the countries as well as to international organizations and international bodies. And that's where we started thinking about the idea of using data and trying to take some of these these cases and these blogs and translate them into data in some way so that we could start to see what patterns are emerging, what trends are emerging that we can't see just through sort of regular narratives Great. and oh. reporting. I'm glad. I'm glad you just mentioned that. Just the aspect of gathering that data and probably finding good ways of um, presenting it to your audience. Um, and I was wondering how um, how do you organize the data and how do you actually end up uh, I mean, end up using it on a day to day basis, or like how do you present it to your audience? Well, I mean the. What, what we started doing was researching the emerging legal framework for digital rights in the region, and we started collecting laws. Like, this seemed like a really sort of, um, if we're talking about the digital rights data set now, um, then we, we started saying, you know, we don't even know what the laws are in a lot of these places. Mm -hmm. And so, and not that in, in that environment, knowing the law isn't necessarily, um, you know, an antidote to being prosecuted uh, under the law because they're they're often very vaguely defined. They're often applied in a very uh, arbitrary way. But at least we needed a baseline of some sort. I think we lost Jessica for a moment there. I think she's coming back. Yeah, she's coming back. <gasps> Sorry about that. Did I do something? No, no. No, no, it's it's okay. You're good. You're back. You're back. I think we just okay. Maybe the <laughs> that's fault. But uh, we're back, and we didn't we didn't miss a lot of your uh, uh, of your story there. So where should I where should I pick it up? Um, yeah, uh, you were just saying that it's um, and that's actually something that I wanted to ask you about um, the fact that it's probably quite difficult to gather data about some states that are not um, completely transparent or open about their about their laws and just the challenges that come up in that and like how do you know what's true and what's not true and like how do you go around like gathering that type of data. Yeah. Um, so we started with a project that um, was just seven countries in the region and what we did was um, the initial sort of data collection process was we worked with people that we knew in each country and um, and they were sort of the expert um, in country who knew the legal systems and knew you know what kinds of cases were coming up and then they would um, provide us with a list of laws from that country. One of the most difficult things was to sort of determine what is a law that affects digital rights and what's not because mm -hmm. what you end up having is a whole wide range of laws um, which you can sort of see on the on the silk that we created with the different categories of laws. You have 
um, people who are being, uh, you have constitutions that in general, which are the foundation of pretty much any legal framework um, or a basic law as it is in Saudi Arabia, um, that, you know, guarantee free expression, um, you know, sometimes sometimes um, they'll guarantee free expression without any qualification. Most of the time, you know, it will be within within the uh, limits of, you know, something or another. And, and, and then you'll have a penal code, and a lot of people are prosecuted under um, defamation in the penal code, different, different types of charges. So you have those two kinds of general laws, which most countries have, but then other, you have media laws, you have telecom regulatory laws, you have increasingly, um, one of the things that we learned by gathering this data is you have a lot of um, uh, new laws in the form of anti-cybercrime and anti-terrorism laws that are being used to uh, to limit digital rights, to limit free expression online. Um, and so it's the methodology of how we do this um, still needs to be refined. Uh, part of it is which are the appropriate laws. Part of it is what kinds of laws are those. Part of it is taking out the different articles that are the ones that are most frequently being used, which is something that we'd like to do in a future step. Um, yeah, let me... And, uh, uh, yeah. And let me share uh, uh, so people can see the actual sites of SMX. And um, if I remember correctly, then here's the bit about your methodology, right? I don't know if everyone exactly. can read it, but people can visit it through the uh, through the uh, showcase yeah. uh, thing, which is the yellow icon, and the address is smexsmex.silk.co. People can uh, check it out. Sorry for interrupting you, but I was waiting for. No, you. no problem. Yeah. No problem. Um, it's, I mean, it's, that's the methodology that we've used today, and I know this was a very sort of grassroots project. Um, we worked with, like I said, a lot of people in our network um, in different countries, some of them lawyers, some of them journalists. Um, in a few, like, we want to bring this forward um, in a couple of ways, and one of the things that we really want to do is um, work with some experts to refine the methodology um, and sort of look at sort of maybe more um, how other organizations and other people who are doing this kind of work, and there are a lot of people doing this kind of work these days, um, uh, how they're also categorizing, categorizing things. What other, you know, how, how can we refine our methodology and make it a bit more, um, make it more rigorous? Are there, are there a lot of other organizations in the Middle East uh, or MENA region that are doing this type of work? That you have been collaborating. Um, yeah, well, I mean, one of the main organizations that we work with in, in the region is uh, Heber.com. They're um, they have a blog, a wireless it's called Wireless Wireless Blog. Um, Lasalki is the name in uh, in Arabic, and they do they cover a lot of digital rights and tech policy in Jordan. Um, they're based in Jordan. They're also um, very active in internet governance. Uh, and uh, and digital rights. Um, then there's you know open Jordan Open Source Association. Um, there's uh, free expression uh, associations in Egypt that we work with, as well as in Tunisia. Um, so, but as in terms of gathering the data like this, um, I would say Jordan is is. Uh, I mean, not Jordan, Heather does some of this, but um, I don't know of any other organizations that are actually sort of taking a regional scope. Um, there is one journalist uh, or journalism professor named Matt Duffy, and he used to teach at, um, I think, Northwestern University in Qatar, I think, or Abu Dhabi, I can't remember where. And he did a great study a couple of years ago on the media laws of GCC countries. Um, and so uh, we reference his work a lot. And he um, has done really great work in getting a lot of those laws uh, from the GCC countries translated into English. And so he's continuing to do that work, and we collaborate a lot with him as well. And that's awesome. Yeah, he's, he's uh, great. Yeah. Build on his work. Yeah, yeah we yeah we all sort of cover what's happening together, and and um, you know, and share share insights on different developments as we go along. But it's still in a very nascent stage. 
And is this kind of this data gathering which you did for this specific silk? Is that something that you were used to already? Is, is this something that you do day to day, or also for other projects? Or uh, well, it's it started with these seven countries, and as soon as we published, um, we had a blog post that I I didn't share you share the link with. We can send it in the in the follow up, but. We did a blog post a, about a year and a half ago on those seven countries, and it was an open data set um, and allowed people to download it. And it was really great because then people started adding their own countries. And in fact, oh, that's um, nice. yeah, so we asked for collaboration. And for example, we had a collaborator from Oman um, you know, put all the Omani laws that are related to digital rights on the spreadsheet. And then we had other people wanting to contribute their laws. Um, and uh, and so then we started saying, okay, well, look, why just stop at these seven countries? We know that you know we have 22 countries in the Arab League. Let's try to uh, let's you know it, this is doable. You know, at the beginning we all thought, oh, this will we'll never be able to find all of these laws. You know, how, how on earth? And, uh, and then after like. doing six or seven countries, we realized this is possible. It takes a little bit of work. You don't have you know necessarily uh, government websites that you know give you all the laws and and in no country on earth can you say I want all the laws related to digital rights and get those laws. Mm -hmm. You know there's a fair amount of research that you have to do. Um, but you know you can find things and you know a lot of international organizations sometimes the ministry website sometimes the embassy website will have um, laws uh, and then you know you'll find translations. Some of them are expert and official, some of them are unofficial. Um, you know, so just through a lot of kind of looking for um, this data and then consulting with people, is this the right draft? You know, what should we, should we include this or not? Um, we were able to put together, uh, I think we're at 20 countries now. I think we're missing uh, Comoros Islands and Djibouti uh, and, you know, maybe a few laws here and there. I know Tunisia needs to be updated. Um, but you know, it, it it was possible, and it was kind of amazing to see how possible it was to to actually see what these legal frameworks were starting to look like. Yeah, I can imagine. Also, when I when I look at the data, uh, you really specifically uh, focused on laws that restrict digital rights. Uh, yeah. And it's um, any news about laws that like uh, protect those rights? <laughs> If it well, may be a bit naive, but uh. um, not naive, I guess. But I think in very few countries in the world, um, like the Marco Civil in Brazil was one of the you know first, and definitely has been the model law that people look to as sort of a proactive affirmation of digital rights. Yeah. Um, there aren't many others like that, um, as far as I know. I know, you know, um, so. And I think you know, in in um, in the Arab region, uh, if there had been something like that, we certainly would have included it. We're not just okay. looking at the bad; we're trying to get the whole scope of things. Um, but you know, mostly these laws are being used to restrict; they're not being used to mm -hmm. um, to expand. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, so, I know, so I know that that's in, where uh, the focus has been. But Tunisia, Tunisia is probably the one place where um, there have been laws that do affirm uh, things like data protection. There's data protection laws. Um, I think there's one in a, a recent one in Tunisia, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but you know, we don't have a lot of access to information laws in the region. We don't have a lot of data protection laws in the region. So. Those yeah. are things that hopefully will come come soon. So, have you had to refer to cases where the government has used these laws to silence and prosecute uh, people who have been who have spoken out against the government or have been exercising their digital rights? And um, so, I'm assuming that you can probably find all that information uh, in the news as well. Um, so, you can find a lot of it in the news. You can find a lot of it from human rights reporting. Uh -huh. um, you know, uh, that's really what a lot of digital citizen is about. Um, as a newsletter, it's a newsletter for the Arab world on the intersection between human rights and technology policy research. And um, we actually have another silk that we've been trying to work on and play around with, where 
we've taken all of the issues and all of the items and all of the issues of the digital citizen since it started in May 2013 and um, tried to come up with some sort of coding structure. Uh, it's a very, very draft uh, kind of um, thing, but we, we had um, uh, Michael Fuchs, who was an intern with us this summer. He worked really, really hard on this, and unfortunately, he couldn't be here today. But um, the idea was to try and create data cards from each case, and then ultimately, mm -hmm. we want to link the cases uh, data cards and data set with the laws data set um, so that we can start to see which laws and ideally which articles of which laws are being used um, most frequently to prosecute people for defamation or for glorifying terrorism or for the other sort of range of different um, crimes that, that, that people are accused of yeah. because they're uh, speaking out online because they're, you know, um, criticizing the government or, um, uh, or just, you know, saying things that people don't like. Yeah, that's, uh, that's incredible. That's pretty much what I was wondering about, actually, so I'm glad you, you covered that. Yeah. Yeah, this would be like a phase two. Um, there are a few, there's another, uh, you know, basically there are several different initiatives that are going on right now where people are trying to somehow get a handle on the emerging legal framework for human rights, both within the Arab world and, the, and Arab countries, as well as sort of globally. Um, there's the Global Free Expression Project at Columbia, um, and there's a number of others. And each of them sort of takes a specific, uh, you know, a different angle. Some of them are really focused on press freedom, so, you know, uh, some of them are, you know, more expansive, yeah. including people who are not, you know, teachers, for example, who are tweeting and something they say draws attention. Uh, so there's a different range of, of how people are looking at these cases. So we're, we're sort of all trying to solve this problem uh, together when we, when we have time to talk about it. Yeah, which actually makes me think, oh, brings me to my next question about that. Do you think that um, civil society has been able to use that type of data and information to hold governments accountable um, to protect and preserve human rights in the, in the digital world? Um, that's a great question. I, I think at this point, I can't point to any, um, I'm trying to think if there's been any, there have been, you know, civil society has been successful in pushing back on some laws, like the cybercrime, the anti-cybercrime law in Iraq that I mentioned, if that was pushed back on. But the problem is, is that it's a very asymmetrical fight. So uh, just like in the States where we, we, you know, have pushed back on like SOPA, PIPA, and now we have, um, uh, you know, this, this Cybercrime Information Sharing Act, which incorporates a lot. So they're able to generate laws faster than we can sort of push back on them. Uh -huh. But a big, a big part of what we're trying to do with the data set is to it really, really the visualization for us is not the product. The, the product is the data itself. And that what we really would like to do with the data, both the, the legal data and the case data, is um, to organize it in such a way that it's accessible to people um, in the region to use to do their own kind of research, to use for advocacy, to pull out the different trends and, um, and challenges that they're seeing, and to be able to have it to be granular enough to where they can use it. At the moment, what happens is, is you have a lot of this data being collected by um, international organizations, governments, NGOs, et cetera, and it gets um, sort of locked into these very narrative formats and PDFs and reports, uh -huh. and then and, and analyses like, uh, or ranking systems like what you have with um, Freedom House's Freedom of the Net report or, or, you know, other sort of ranking systems. You know, this country is, you know, number 67, and that's, you know, up yeah. four points from last year. And... And but the problem is, is all that research is being done, but it's not being uh, made accessible to others. So and it's not being made accessible, especially to people in the region. So um, we want to create some framework for looking at what's happening with digital rights in the region in terms of the laws and the cases, in a way that other people can access that data openly and use it for what they think they need to use it for, not necessarily for country rankings, but, but you know, to put together better policy briefs or 
to, you know, design better campaigns. And maybe that will be advocating to their own governments. Maybe it will be advocating to the UN and those structures. Maybe mm -hmm. it will be advocating to, you know, ex external governments. Maybe it will be to raise awareness around the need for digital rights expansion among the populace. So um, we just want to make, you know, it's, it exists. We want to help organize it, work with others to organize it, and make it available for people to do um, what they need with it. So the idea is to have the data set and have people build APIs or other kinds of ways of, of working on top of that. So if uh, someone would go to, uh, to, your, to the silk, as you said, then feel it's just as important that they can, like, Get the get the concrete data so they can get the access to information law in Morocco translated, for example, like you say here. Uh, yeah, and then it's on the homepage. We also um, we've been uploading, uh, or I think we we have the file where you can actually download the file itself and and work with it and play with it. Um, uh, like the law, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, uh, if I go here, then you see that yeah, the original law. You mean? No, no, no. Um, if you go to the home page and you go all the way down to the bottom. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, the silk home page. And you go all the way to the bottom uh, right-hand corner, there's a place where you can actually download the data set. Ah, yeah, that's very nice. Yeah. yeah I see it here. Yeah. And we're going to, one thing that we haven't, that's been a bit time consuming is sort of every time we make a change, we have to upload the data set. So we're looking for a better solution to that. Yeah, we're going to um, help you with that. <laughs> Uh, awesome. Pretty soon uh, we can. Uh, uh, we are still uh, uh, like finalizing it, but pretty soon mm -hmm. we expect to offer uh, a connection with your Google Sheets and Silk, so that if you up the, update the sheet, then it will be updated on the other end. Yeah, there will be an automatic uh, sync oh, that's uh, awesome. feature, that's which will be fantastic. really amazing. So you don't have to like we upload your information. You can just change it on your Google spreadsheet, and then just uh, enable those changes automatically on Silk, and it will update all your visualizations without you having to recreate them. That's fantastic. Great to know. So yeah. hopefully, awesome work. It's help on the way. <laughs> help us on the way, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. while um, collecting all this information and um, data, did you, did you end up uh, uncovering trends and how these rights are developing um, and or being used? Yeah, I think the the main thing, the main trends that we saw were really this um, use of other types of laws like anti-cyber crime laws and anti-terrorism laws to restrict speech. These are new forms of laws that are trying to cope with uh, new developments that are a result of, in many cases, digital technologies and social media. And, um, you know, the challenge is that in these countries we don't have, you know, either a due process for how the laws are drafted. It's not a public process. There's very mm. little comment period. Sometimes the drafts uh, aren't ever released even before they're enacted. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that uh, use, using those kinds of laws to further restrict speech. Um, so for example, cybercrime, there's no international definition for it. Uh, it's sort of you know what it is when you see it kind of thing, which leaves a lot of room for uh, interpretation. And so now in some countries, simply uh, saying something unpopular or critical over using an electronic device or a network uh, constitutes a cybercrime. So we're seeing a lot of that kind of language and application of that language, especially in Gulf countries, um, with cybercrime laws, which which wasn't something that had been, um, you know, uh, necessarily very apparent before. Um, and the same is for anti-terrorism laws. I think maybe that uh, you have the same thing. And you also start to see that um, countries kind of pass laws in clusters sometimes where, you know, uh, Kuwait passes a law and then, you know, Saudi Arabia passes a law. And so you start to um, actually, you can't make any um, definitive statements based on that, but it can start to really give you something, a, a, a backward against which to start 
asking different questions, right? Like, how are these countries learning from each other? How are they talking about things like digital rights and, and legislating uh, to restrict, restrict the use of social media at regional conferences or international conferences? So really what the data has done for us is, is help us come up with a whole new raft of questions for what we might want to be asking about digital rights and look at different ways in which countries are, are, are managing them or restricting them. Um, it's definitely presented a lot more questions than answers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let's say. Oh yeah, that's yeah. Um, Have you found that certain laws that are maybe similar across two countries or more are being applied differently in these countries? Or um, used differently? I, we have, we, I haven't done that specific analysis, but that again mm -hmm. would be a great, a great thing to, uh, to investigate. Um, I'm not also a legal expert, so mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily know that I'm, I, you know, we would be the organization to do that work, but we would love if, you know, lawyers and, and people who are doing this kind of human rights um, and law would, would start asking those questions based on the data that we're trying to provide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. And um, um, I think we, we already covered a bit about, like, the the impact of your work, but uh, um, maybe you have some some on, some information on that about this specific resource. Like, what did it? Uh, what did you have? Like, uh, people that used it for something interesting or already for the data set? Yeah, the 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 Smex, uh, the Silk site. Um. Well, I don't have any uh, sort of anecdotes. Uh, at the moment, we've only presented it um, at a conference, at an internet policy conference in September, like a, a research methods workshop, and we got a lot of good feedback with it. Um, we haven't, <laughs> because we're a bit understaffed, we haven't uh, promoted it via, we've promoted it on social media, but we haven't put it in our email newsletter yet, and we've also been sort of um, wanting to refine the methodology and get some more expert input before we really go wide with it. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. We also want to put it in Arabic. So that that's another. We're sort of reluctant to launch anything unless we can do it in Arabic and English at the same time. Or yeah, Arabic. I can imagine. The we do left to right to left, but the tables and stuff is uh, is hard, right? Yes, the yeah. tables is hard. Uh, hopefully, we'll you know it would be great if if we could figure it out somehow. Uh, if you guys could figure it out, but uh, but yeah, the Arabic works in terms of the data cards, but in terms of the way the tables read, it's 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 not the uh, it doesn't work. So. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll work on it. Maybe someday. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully, as you say, you're understaffed. We're understaffed. Um, yeah, right. We yeah, all are. Know. There's so many awesome things that we want to be working on. Um, and hopefully, hopefully that will come. That will come soon, definitely. I'm sure. I can only imagine how hard it how hard it must be in general for people using right to left languages for in sharing in publishing and stuff online. We've seen a lot, a lot of progress over the years, but yeah, it's still it's still always sort of a consideration that you kind of go, oh wait, you know, you find something and you're like, oh that's fantastic, and then you're like, wait. Can it read Arabic? <laughs> and yeah. most, of the, most of the time, it's like mm, there might be some problems with that. So, but um, but super amount of progress. Uh, so, um, you're um, you're also working on two other projects uh, using Silk. Is that it? Or uh, well, the one is I think we already showed it actually, which is the the right. case data for the digital rights. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we don't. Actually, they're not using Silk in terms of using the application, but um, we have two other projects, and uh, one of them is a resource library for um, all kinds of guides and manuals on how to use different types of technology. And there's, um, it's an aggregated sort of resource library um, with a strong focus on Arabic language resources. So there's a data visualization category in that that Silk is a part of. And then the other main thing that we're doing now that has to do with data visualization is um, hosting a digital journalism course for um, 70 journalists from eight countries or nine countries in the region. And there's, it's an eight-week online course. 
Uh, and um, the sixth week, I think, is um, all about data collection and gathering and visualization. And we'll definitely be pointing um, the students to silk for their assignments. So, oh, that's great. <laughs> that's what we're doing. Yeah, those are the other the other projects that we're working on right now. Is it going to yeah. be the first time that you launch this uh, data journalism class, or has it happened before? No, we. It's the first time we've done this digital journalism course in general. It's eight weeks long, and um, data journalism. It's the first time that we've done. Uh, a data journalism module like that. So we worked with um, an Egyptian data journalism specialist. Everything is in Arabic. The whole course is in Arabic, um, okay. which, yeah, which is sort of, you know, um, I don't know of other. I mean, there are some ICFJ courses and there are some courses that are in Arabic, but nothing quite like this. I think, especially with the focus on so many different digital journalism skills. So if people are interested in uh, joining this class, uh, where where can they find information about it on your website? Um, unfortunately, it's uh, it's already started, and so oh, never mind. Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a moderated course, so it doesn't have open enrollment. But eventually, um, I think we will create a version of the course uh, for open enrollment, and um, we'll probably host it um, on. Well, we're still sort of trying to figure out where we're going to host it, but um, but yeah, we're, the idea is to sort of break down the course into separate uh, uh, modules and then to release them so that they can be more self-directed learning rather than moderated learning, which is what we're doing now. So. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, I can imagine that um, uh, that you see a lot of naturally you see a lot of data journalism in the Middle Middle East region. And also, but also Western data journalism. I think. Is there? Do you have any idea of what like uh, Western data journalism can learn from what is happening over there, or vice versa? Is there any differences you see? I would say that data journalism in the Middle East is actually at a very, very early stage. There's really very few examples that we are able to pull together, even for our course. Um, there's a guy, um, I can't remember his full name, but it's Amr or something, and he ha he's Egyptian. He runs something called Info Times, and he does data journalism trainings. Um, there, the uh, Tarek Amr, who used to work for the Open Data Foundation, I think, um, that's what it's called, right? Open Knowledge Foundation. Um, he used to do um, data courses, and he's the one that did the data journalism module for our journalism program. But you don't see data journalism in the Middle East, even in the, maybe some on the Al Jazeera website, but you don't see um, media outlets really using it in the same way that you do uh, in in more Western uh, papers. If you guys can think of any, or Sarah, I can see you're like maybe thinking, no, trying I'm to thinking, see what I'm you wondering. know. If, um, if it's because you think that information is actually harder to collect in the Middle East. Because there's no transparency, as, as much as it would be here. I think that's, I mean, that's always the, the refrain that you get is like, oh, it's really hard to get data. But there is, there is a lot of data available. It's just not nearly as accessible. Um, and it might take a little bit more work to clean it, to find it, to clean it, to, to put it into some sort of format, like what we're seeing with the laws. Um, I hope that as a result of this course that we're giving that a lot of people get interested in data journalism and start to see um, just how many data sets, I mean, because there's a lot of data sets that you can get from international organizations, uh, even if your governments aren't providing them. But a lot of the Gulf countries, I think, like the Emirates maybe, they, they, have, um, they have an open data platform. So it would be great to see, um, you know, I don't know the quality of the data, I don't know what they're tracking or what they're sharing. Um, but it would be great to see uh, Arab journalists and Arab media outlets start to explore more data journalism. Um, and yeah. why? I guess why do you think that's important, or why do you, how what role do you see for data journalism and tools like Silk um, in empowering and educating civil society? Uh, well, I think you know. I think it's it's a real. Um, First of all, it gets more people engaged, right? Especially the visualizations. We all know that we like to look at visualizations. Um, if you look at organizations like Visualizing Impact and Visualizing Palestine and the kinds of infographics that they do, 
um, you know, it really, it really, um, it attracts people. So I think civil society could use more visualizations to get more people to support them, to to develop a broader constituencies, um, and to communicate better and educate better around the issues that they are advocating for. Um, I think also journalists or you know who are trying to work in the public interest in the region should use more data journalism to sort of back up their their facts and assertions. To sort of it's it's a great resource for you know, if you're doing it well and you can explain your methodology and how you've collected your data and your data sources, it's a great opportunity for um, evidence-based sort of um, opinions or analysis or policymaking and reporting. So, um, you know, I think, I, I mean, I think that's the same as it is in, in anywhere, but I, I do think that we should be leveraging more of it. Um, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, I, I think so. I think so too. I hope we can play our part. All yeah, I hope so too. Anyway, you know, um, I I, you shared you shared some links uh, with me before. Maybe uh, uh, maybe you want to go through them a little bit. Uh, sure. Did we not mention them all already? Yeah, but I'm I'm not sure if I showed them uh, uh, yet. So maybe we can uh, maybe. What's that one? Okay. Yeah, I don't know what that uh, one is. <laughs> okay, so that one that one's Toshatic. That's the resource library that we um that we created. It's available in English and Arabic. And if you scroll down to the middle of the page and you click on that stop, stop, stop and yeah. go up a bit, uh there's a button just above the witness. Just above the witness there's a button that's for sort of advanced search. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Sarah. There. <laughs> yeah. Maybe Sarah can help. If you go to the the second arrow. Yeah. And then there's one. Which one, Sarah? Can you help? And which one is the data visualization category? Um. I, or we can do it in English if we want. There's a lot. Uh, uh, here, I think it's uh, it's been a. I can also, no. there's an English button. Put it in English, Put it in English yeah. <laughs> Do the same thing, advanced filter. Oh, it's uh, to the left. Here oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. No. <laughs> and then issues, keywords, and then there's the data collection and visualization category. Uh, oh, there we go, the third row. To the okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Oh, so, so, and if you scroll down, so yeah, if it's highlighted and you scroll down, um, you'll get a lot of, and it's it's mixed between Arabic and English now, but um, uh, you'll get the English. We're gonna we're we're gonna be doing another version of this platform soon that will also include Farsi uh, resources, um, and it will be more user friendly. Right now, it's not the user friendliest of websites, but it does have an incredible amount of sort of resources and manuals um, about different uh, tools and guides and. Things That's like that about different categories of using tech for social change. Great. So that's one thing. In the, uh, yeah, that's such a valuable. This is, like really amazing. Yeah. Oh, awesome. And this is um, this is our online learning platform that we use for. Um, like I said, it's not like a MOOC, so we only do moderated courses on it right now. But um, the course uh, on the bottom right with the guy at the computers is um, this our digital journalism course, so oh, yeah. that's all that is. Yeah, and this is only available in Arabic. Yeah, it looks yeah. beautiful. <laughs> it's very oh, thanks. ignorant of me to say it. It only looks beautiful to me, oh. but of course cannot be <laughs> at all. But uh, <laughs> yeah, numbers, I see some. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing those with us, and I hope that people listening in will be able to, um, to take a look at them as well. Um, yeah. We'll probably... Um, have these resources listed after the webinar um, online, so people can access them easily. Yeah, they're uh, they're also listed in the yellow uh, showcase button. There, okay, and, uh, and uh, I'll I'll email everyone on the list afterwards with a, with a list of relevant links. Um. So we've um, we've pretty much like asked you a lot of questions uh, for this hour, and I hope you're still ready for a few more of them. Um, <laughs> if if our listeners are um, 
um, have any questions or want to ask Jessica or, or us anything about data journalism or digital rights in the Arab world, um, you can, on the left-hand side, uh, you can access the Q&A um, button and just um, drop, drop questions and we'll gladly answer them now. You can also uh, email email us or uh, uh, with any questions you have for us or Jessica later. Um, and uh, uh, one for users that like want to follow you or uh, uh, like uh, keep up with what your guys are doing. I, the, your website is very informative, of course. That makes a lot of sense. But you're also active on social media, I think. Definitely. You can find us at uh, on Twitter at SMEX, so at SMEX, S-M-E-X. And on Facebook, it's also facebook.com uh, slash SMEX. And, um, and then our, both the Tasharek, the resource database, also has a social media account. But probably if you go, if you just use at SMEX or um, the Facebook page, you'll find most of what we're doing. And then anyone who wants to reach out to me directly, I'm on Twitter and uh, uh, it's at Jess Deer, which is my last name, Jess, and then my last name, Deer. Yes. And our website is www.smex.org. Yes, <laughs> it's, uh, it's between the links, but it's 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 a really nice, well updated website to uh, follow along with what you're doing. And you also have an interesting blog, I may say. Uh, oh, thanks. It's, <laughs> we just yes. kind of post whatever is happening at the moment that we need to, yeah, try to comment on. Yeah, it was flattering, uh, flattering for us, of course, also that you like you wrote a very nice post about your uh, the turning loss into data uh, about the uh, silk. Uh, you did great. that. It's a great read. Like big, make sure to share that too. And um, we'll probably be we'll probably be writing a, a follow up post after this webinar. Um, because uh, actually our, our colleagues at HIPAA have been asking us to write sort of a, a backstory of how we did find a lot of the laws and kind of some, a lot of the questions that you guys have been asking. So this would be good uh, note taking for us. <laughs> oh, great. We can start, we'll, we'll turn it into a blog post or we'll just send them the video. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can help a little bit with a brainstorming session for that. <laughs> yeah. Great. Cool. Uh, yeah, I think we learned a lot today, uh, uh, Jessica. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming. It was real fun. Um, it was great. Yeah, um, and uh, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And uh, we'll, um, uh, we'll email you with any links we shared, like I said. And um, uh, stay tuned for our next webinar. And uh, yeah, Jessica, good luck with, with, with all your uh, cool projects. I, uh, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll stay in touch. I'm sure we will too, and thank you very much. This is a fantastic opportunity for us, so we're really glad to be able to share what we're doing. Yeah. And doing with Silk. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, thanks. See you guys later. Bye. Have a great day. Bye.